Hello and you're very welcome to another edition of the JMOC Podcast. I'm John Mann and of course this podcast is sponsored by OrgoRetro.com. Check the website out for all your retro gear needs. And tonight, guys, I am joined by two staunch answer men. So Kevin McGarty, CJ McGarty. So I'll start off with the uh, man at the moment. Kevin, how are you? I suppose I'm alive, John. Um, strange times, but yeah, just... Uh, Getting struggling on like everybody else and head down and just uh, get on with it. That's all we can do. Absolutely. And yourself, CJ, how strict are you? You've been busy with a newborn, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we got our um, eight weeks old now, so um, just a bit like Cabin, just busy in school at the minute too, and just with the wee one and stuff. So um, be be nice to get out on the football pitch in the next couple of weeks and play a bit of ball again. So. Um, until then, I suppose it's just sort of changing nappies and stuff like that until then. <laughs> much like myself, much like myself. And I suppose, Kevin, I, I can ask you this question first, but uh, how have you found the lockdown and uh, the last year, I suppose, and everything that comes with it, Kevin? Yeah, it's been difficult uh, for everybody, I suppose. Let's first and foremost remember that, unfortunately, some people have lost their lives to this and um, people that we know, of course, and many GA families right across the country. But, um, you know, it, it's mentally it's challenging for everybody. And, and I suppose one of the great things about the GA back home is that it's a great support network for a lot of people. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's challenging. So, you know, you just have to keep yourself busy. You have to keep yourself tuned in, you know, people going out for walks or, you know, do you know, I have a, a, a bit of a gym in the garage, so I'll go in there not too often as I would like, but a uh, <laughs> bit of that and, and doing a bit of golf, you know, and it just keeps the head right, John. Um, so, you know, it's 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 tough times to get through, but hopefully we, we can see the end in sight here now. And as as Connor maybe alluded to there, it's, it's, it's going to be absolutely terrific for everybody, you know, to see, most importantly, the clubs back in action, you know, kids getting out onto the pitches, <laughs> coaches and mentors being able to work with the kids again, which is a big... It's a huge thing for their mental health as well. Supporters being able to come to matches, whether that be club games or indeed, hopefully in the future, inter county games. And, you know, it'll, it'll give the whole nation a lift. Um, so, yeah, look, it's it's not the best of times, John, but as I say, light at the end of the tunnel, always have a positive thought. That's where we're going. That's where we're heading. And and uh, hopefully we'll get there very soon. Yeah, definitely. And what about yourself, CJ? How, how are you finding it all? I know we was you a couple of months ago, but sure, we're, we're still in this uh, shit, really, CJ. <laughs> yeah, look, as I say, uh, um, it's, it, ha- it has been tough. Um, I think Kevin touched on a point there where it was, you know, people have lost their lives to this and people within, you know, our own clubs and within our own counties have lost family members or indeed um, relatives to this as well. So, that's the most important thing, and, and I said the way back um, way when I was chatting before Christmas that the most important thing when we get back in the field is that we stay back in the field, and that you know you don't want another go back too early and then the season cut short again. So hopefully that we've got this, um, where as Kevin says, the sort of light at the end of the tunnel, and we're through the worst of it, where we actually when we do get back in the field in the next couple of weeks that. Um, that we that we remain there for the, the the summer months, as I say, the clocks went back there over the weekend. So hopefully that's a sign of you know good things to come, especially for the GA sort of people that look forward to them sort of eight o'clock throw-ins on a Wednesday night or a Sunday night where they can go to, to go to different games and I say it's probably not only just the players, but you know obviously coaching myself and stuff that mentors, um, coaches, supporters that. It's a massive network, so it's it's not just the players that are that are struggling. It's also people that are fanatical about the game that can't go to matches over this past number of months that are probably hurting as well. Yeah, geez, super agree with all that. And I suppose, Kev, uh, how, how much has this kind of changed your perspective and everything with this COVID? Like, is it you know, how, like has it changed your views and stuff? And I suppose it's as I as, as you always allude to, like it's um, we're all kind of locked away and there's not much to do, Kevin. So has it changed your perspective on a lot of stuff? Yeah, I suppose so. Um, look. Life is going to be very different when we get on the far side of this. John, you know, people's work culture is going to be very different. People are going to know mental health-wise, they're going to be much stronger from it, you know, coming out of it. Um, you know, we, we learn an awful lot about ourselves in these in these times. And I suppose, you know, John, from, from a GA perspective, we cherish our games all the time. Our product at the minute is absolutely horrible. I have to say that, you know, I don't look forward to watching matches on the TV, 
but you know the GA can learn an awful lot from this. You know, the community, the GA community, has shown its true colours. You know, uh, up and down the country, helping support families, getting food parcels, people in aid, elderly people. So the, the network there is great. But you know, let's let's come back in a positive light and let's learn that you know maybe moving forward that you know we did take our games for granted. You know. You know, we did run away with the rules. We did lose ourselves a bit. We have lost ourselves a bit in Gaelic football. Definitely, we've lost ourselves a bit. So, you know, let's let's cherish our games. Let's realise what we have, and let's try in the future to to make changes that will that will be positive for the game moving forward. Yeah, and what about yourself, CJ? Like, has it kind of changed your perspective and things? And um, yeah, do, do you know what, John? It, it has. Um, I suppose maybe I'm I'm towards retirement age anyway in the next couple of years but I, I've been speaking to you know I say I've spoke to a couple of boys in the school a minute at the minute I spoke to one or two people from around sort of Arbo where I'm living at the minute and there's people there that are around the 25, 26, 27 mark that actually are now going do you know what I'm dreading going back to them yeah. do you know why because I actually didn't realise what I could do with my time even though we couldn't go out or we couldn't do X, Y and Z they were still, the, you're, it's nearly now the norm where you come home from work, you're actually able to chill out for a couple of hours, where in, in normal you you have to head out training every night and it started to become a chore. So it'll be very interesting when we get back how many people actually do see a, a, another side to it because I think people actually enjoy the time off and that's just regular club players. Yeah. So it'll be very interesting to see commitment levels when we go back for certain sort of age groups and, and sort of especially at underage as well how sort of children have adapted and their their, their skill based stuff that they've been doing at home, how, how that, you know, it has improved or not improved in, in some cases. So it'd be very interesting in all aspects when we get back. Yeah, yeah, super. I agree with all that. And I suppose we can, we can start with yourself first, Kevin. And uh, you you had a long uh, winding career with uh, St. Gauls and Antrim, of course. And I suppose um, we, we, can, we can touch on the magic uh, club that is St. Gauls. And um, I suppose what, you know, obviously everyone starts off at underage, but what age were you when you started playing for St. Gauls, uh, Kevin? And I suppose you can, you can touch on the underage and the senior success that you've uh, had over the years. I suppose probably the day and hour that I was born in the Royal, I probably went up past the club and down the lane, so probably about two days old. I think we, I think my younger sister Marisa might hold the record for being the youngest person ever in all Ireland final. I think she went to the Down Mead game we were in the Nally Stand in 1991. She was born on the 28th of August, so she must have been about, I don't know, she must have been about 14 or 15 days old when she was fired in the all Ireland final. So that was the family we were born into. So. We didn't really have a choice, um, you know, Dad had obviously played for the club and, and it was obviously we were going to follow follow down there and, you know, I think it's a great thing for him to be, he was very pushy with us, you know, he was very, very pushy with us, his generation were very successful, you know, I think it, it was a big part of his life and, and he wanted all them positive experiences for his children, so I mean, we, we were all very, very young. Cairns a year older than me. So, you know, I suppose when he would have went down training, I was down training with him. It was the two of us at once. When Dad was going down to play a match, Mum was working most weekends, so we would have just went down with Dad. So it was the two of us or three of us or four of us in the back of a car. And, and so, you know, we got, it was, you know, a story like many, many other families up and down the country. We were basically born into it, John. Yeah, and um, what about yourself, Siege? If you, if I ask you the same question, like when did you kind of get the ball rolling with St. Gauls, and um, uh, how special of a club is it to you up there? Yeah, I say it's special. I say we've sort of we've gone through rough times at the minute, like, but every club does, um, you know, and that's the way it goes. We, I suppose, not every club has its ups and downs, but we had probably we we really did have ups, if you know what I mean. Some people would count ups for the clubs as county championships and stuff. We were lucky enough to, to reach the pinnacle, like, you know, but I um, suppose it's pretty much like Kevin, you know, uh, remember younger days where, you know, it was just out of the house and you were down kicking, you know, and I see, I still see it with younger boys and some goals, like, like the Tyrone Needles kids or who just come down and when you're that four or five, you just go down and kick the ball about by yourself when your dad's training and stuff like that. So I suppose it was a benefit that sort of, for me, that Kieran and Kevin were that wee bit older and, you could kick about with them when dad was training and you know, you know there was other boys there in that team like 
and uh, Paul Veronica, his dad would have played and stuff. So there's probably other boys more so around Kevin and Kieran's age that probably, you know, it nearly like came a mini training session when you were down at senior training because there's so many sort of kids there. And it's probably something we'll miss now in today's games. Um, you know, if you were going to senior training now, you wouldn't really see structured play, as you would call it, where in them days you would have went down and there's, there was structured play where it was nearly like matches between yourselves at, you know, no matter what age you were like. So um, sort of the memory stick to, with me and it was, it, it's just nice that six or seven that group probably came through together and won all Ireland. So I, I think that's where the seed was sort of sown away back in them, when them days when you were just beginning to walk. And that was sort of, that was the lifestyle. You just get out of the house and you went with your dad or your mum would have brought you to your dad's matches and stuff like that. So um, that's how it all sort of began. Yeah, I suppose, Kevin, like we were kind of alluding to it, like how special is Club Terrebonne? Like, and, you know, it, 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 as you said, like you have had fantastic careers with St. Gauls over the years. And, you know, like how special was it to you when you're kind of at your peak, I suppose, Kevin? Um, I, I don't know really, John, if you can describe it to another individual who hasn't maybe experienced that. You know, if you go to somebody like maybe the Gooch or, you know, to guys up in Slot Neil or somebody down in Kilmacud, they can maybe tell you how special it is. It's very, very difficult to describe to somebody from outside, and that's that's no disrespect to anybody. You know, when when you come away from the game, um, after you've retired and finished, and you have that unique medal that we do, um, you know, there's hundreds of other... When you look back on it, there's hundreds of other players that want to be where you were or and, and will never get there. They will never experience some of the the moments and the emotions and the the feelings that we had, and and you know I suppose that's the thing about making history or doing something very special within a group. Those are the moments and 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 times that you will cherish most, and that's what I would say to somebody about how special your club is to you. Them them moments of you know Connor was talking there about going down to matches and stuff. We weren't just brought up by our parents. We were brought up by the people in St. Gauls. You know, we were fired into the back of a bus on a Sunday and going up into the Glens of Antrim for hurling games or going to South West Antrim for a football match. That was our life. Um, and they were all very special, unique moments that built up to that special crescendo of being in Crow Park twice. Um, so it's each person has their own different, unique journey within any given club, whether it be a rural club, uh, 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 an urban club, whether it be a club with a lot of money or a club with very few members, each person has their own unique experience. But to say to someone how special is your club when you've been to um, when you've been to the very pinnacle of of, of, of club championship in Ireland, it, it's very difficult for us to describe that, John. Yeah, and what about yourself, CJ? Obviously. Probably touching on to what Kevin was saying, but how special is it? And like you know, it it, it made you the players you are to you is where I suppose. Yeah, look, probably Kevin's just described it, you know, very well there in terms of, you know, it, you know, it is hard explaining to people like when you know, obviously when you win it, and and even now people would ask me, you know, I would near get that question once every six seven months from different individuals that I haven't met in a while, or you know, I'm only getting to meet new. And say, geez, what was it like? And you you could speak to them for half an hour about it, but they actually wouldn't understand, you know. So it it's just it, it it's a bit like the soccer, you know. I, I read Scott Brown there last week saying he was leaving Celtic, but no one actually knows what the Celtic family means unless you're actually inside it and you you're there going every single day. So people like St. Gauls means a lot to us, and you know, there's other clubs out there that mean a lot to to their club members and stuff like that, but. Every club is slightly different, and as I say, there's members within the club that have different views about how special it is or what was their favourite moment and stuff. So it is very hard to explain that sort of three or four days before the match, three or four days after it, three or four days after, or getting beaten in all Ireland. Again, no one understands them experiences unless you've really been through them difficult three or four days, you know, of getting beaten in all Ireland. Fans. So it is hard to explain, but you know, as I said to you before, just about, the, you know, going to, down Jones's Road and stuff with, the, you know, with, as I say, with them people that you sort of kicked about with in the wet, rainy days when you're five and six was something very special. 
Yeah, yeah, super. I suppose we, we can touch on the 2010 All Ireland final, uh, Kevin. It's the pinnacle of any club team to get there. And St. Paddy's Day, Croke Park, as I always say, it's, it's it's just an unbelievable feeling. I suppose, uh, like, you know, just unbelievable times for you and just, uh, just an incredible journey, I suppose, Kevin. Yeah, John, but maybe before I say that, I'd just like to say that I think it's an absolute tragedy that the GA has come away from that date. Um, there, I look. I fully accept this issue, and, and fair play to Michael Brody and all these guys in the, uh, uh, in the club players association. I fully understand that you know it, the semi final there you get after Christmas is either heartbreak or not. You know, um, and it's a long time to wait, and there's players maybe that aren't available to county teams at that stage, and blah blah blah. It, it's a joke. In fact, that the GA has gone away from that date. It's such a unique day in Irish society. So many people going to Dublin, not only for the parade, but going to watch our our spectacle on the national holiday. And I think it's it's due a rethink. Um, yeah, I mean, we had been there before. 2006 for me was much more unique. Um, it was actually a traumatic couple of weeks in 06 for me. I just lost the Sigerson file maybe three or four days before. Sorry, four or five days beforehand. Um, to DCU in Dublin um, so I can't really remember the build up the 06 because it was just that busy training um, I remember 2010 a lot more in terms of the, the atmosphere and, and the days and, uh, and weeks leading up to it but 06 for me that, that uniqueness of being the first Antrim club to, to arrive on the scene in Crow Park and football and making that big statement and then I suppose letting ourselves down, John, you know, you remember that. I still remember more about the 06 final than I do about the 2010 final. So they're unique times. Um, it's great when you make history. And I'd probably say this, that I think that we should have two All-Irelands uh, and we don't. And uh, it haunts you. That haunts you. Um, it haunts you every, you know, I was out golfing last week and I was thinking about the 06 final. So that's sort of that's sort of how special and important moments in your life that was. Um, but certainly doing what we've done in 2010, making that bit of history, you come into sport at the very highest level to make an impression. Um, people do that in very, very different ways. People are lucky in that their club's a senior club. We were very lucky at the group of players we had. But ultimately, we leave the sport with a legacy in within our county, really and utterly unique. Um, and And... It fills you with pride when you speak about it. Yeah, and does that 06 final you're talking like was that why your golf game's not on at the minute, Kevin? Or what's the story? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think my, uh, I think there's a lot of people in some golf, like Sir Johnny Flynn and Wiggy and people like that. They'll tell you my golf game's never been on, but uh, <laughs> no, it does, John. It haunts. I mean, yeah. I'd say if you want the intercounty footballers up and down the country and they talk about maybe an All Ireland semi final or final or something like that. There is moments that haunt you and they shape you and they drive you and they motivate you. Um, I lost three Sigerson, two Sigerson finals before I won one and memories of that haunted me as well. So, I mean, so Connor said it there, sometimes you have to you have to take the defeats on the chin, you have to learn um, and you have to get back up onto the wagon and go again. And, and that's really about the character and the guts and the determination of a group. And I think we had that in abundance. Yeah, and what, what about yourself, Siege? Obviously, t- you know, two appearances in All Ireland uh, cl- um, Cup finals, and you obviously got over the line in 2010. But what did that win mean to you in 2010 and as a club as a whole, I suppose, CJ? Yeah, I suppose, look, again, Kevin's 100% right. I just like, it's an absolute disgrace. I, I can't say it enough that it's embarrassing that the GA have got away from St. Patrick's Day. It really is. And I know there has to be changes in calendars and stuff like that. But for any club player, and this is where the GA would need to sort of realise what they're doing. If you ask 95% of club players, you know, or sorry, 100%, 95 would say that, yeah, keep the fans on St. Patrick's Day. Yeah. You know, and that's where that's where the GA just aren't, you know, they aren't uh, liaising with players or, you know, the the, the system the players have or whatever else in, in place. And it's, it's discussing. But um, I suppose, yeah, 2010 was good. I say I was only 17 when... And come on in the first final in 06 so um again it always haunts me and people always say to me and I, you'll never know but if you had been on earlier or and, and no one know if i had been on earlier i could have had the worst game in my life you know and that's just you just don't know if i had a you know been on two minutes before you may have scored that who knows but 
it, it's always one that haunts you, yeah, the 06 final, but 2010, and Kevin alluded to it there just very briefly, and when he was talking, I was sort of thinking that it shows how good a team we had, and it shows how much it meant to the players and the group of players to come back from that victory, you know, the resilience, the, the hurt, the pain that over the next three or four seasons, we got ourselves together again, and we went back for another drive at it, and um, Kevin says about two all irons like we lost, or we should maybe have two. We could, like with a wee bit of luck, you know, Cross McGlenn beat us by two points in 2011, and we missed a penalty that day, and Kevin was injured. We also had Sean Burke who was injured as well, you know, so Cross beat us in Cross, and they went down to win the all iron. So if you had to get over that match, You'd never, you you would never know. Again, you could have been beaten the next round, but you could have also won it. So we're not. Connor, is, about... is that the day that uh, Joe McQuillan actually put on a cross McGlenn top? <laughs> you, you could say that about the cap man, yeah. Um... Actually, <laughs> John, that game. Somebody, somebody who will remain anonymous uploaded it to YouTube. The first half, I would advise people to go and watch it. It's probably the most embarrassing refereeing performance I've ever seen. Yeah, so again, and that's just the way it goes sometimes, but we're up against cross and cross. The referee was obviously pulling for them and whatever else. But look, we weren't that far away. But 2010, look, it's something that uh, I, we talk about 06 and maybe 2011 haunting us. But if we hadn't got over the lane in 2010 or we never ever get back to Croke Park, it would haunt us even more. Yeah. You know, so as a club, it was it was absolutely, and again, it was in our centenary year. So that made it even more special and again we talked we talked about it earlier in the show about you know how unique different members are and different types of clubs that, that, that are in ireland we believe like anyone else that our clubs you know the most unique and the best and x y and z but we have some boys there like sean kelly senior you know like tony early like people like that that put in you know um paul gribbon my own dad pj O'Hare, boys like that that sort of put in Frank McGuire, God rest him, that put in years at juvenile level to get us boys there. So, you know, it nearly meant as much to them as it did to us, you know, and, and that was also, I got a lot personally from the smile in their face rather than, than my own. Um, and that was fatally important to us as well. That We appreciated the work that was put into us and the hours that were put into us from a hell of a lot of different individuals. Yeah, and it's like that win says the thing, Kevin. Like, how much does that kind of rejuvenate the club? And like, it, it gives the whole community, the club, yourselves, everyone such a lift as well, Kevin. When you think about it, um, it does and it doesn't, John. I'm going to say something um, controversial here, but um, it wouldn't be like me. Um, <laughs> I suppose 2010 was. Was almost a downfall of St. Gauls in a lot of ways, senior football wise. Um, we had reached the pinnacle. We had probably, um, as a squad, we were in a good age. Connor mentioned our 2011. We started to pick up a lot of injuries. Maybe, boys, I can honestly say to you after that win, there was, I was certainly demotivated a wee bit. Maybe I wasn't going pressing forward in the way I should be. Um, Sean Burke wasn't available that next year. There was a lot of injuries started to be picking up. We started to go sort of in 2010. We were playing bar maybe 07, the best football that we have ever played. Um, and we started then to go downhill from there and rapidly downhill. I mean, the following year, I think we won the next three Anthem Championships, but one of them actually we got down us the club semi final against Kilku. And we actually had Kilku on the ropes and they got a sort of a, they got a lucky break and they got a goal. And, you know, in fairness to them, they went on and wrapped up the game. And, you know, when I look back in that match, that was probably us saying goodbye to Ulster, really. Two day, two years later, we haven't been really back there since. Um, so, when it's 2010, at the time we didn't know it, I would say that that was the, the high point for that team. And ever since... St. Gauls as a club has never reached any sort of heights and indeed now at the minute as Conor Shane is, it's going through quite a difficult time. Um, so, you know, it meant a lot to us at the time. It meant we hoped it would be the start of the journey, but really it was almost, you know, when Hank said it was the end of a journey. Yourself, Connor, would like would you be off the same opinion? Yeah, look, it's yeah. very it's it's very difficult to say. Um 
clubs clubs have up and ups and downs. Um, I suppose we had a sort of once in a generation of a team that I you know they got great coaching. The, you know the structures were good at under age because there was something done about it way back in the nineties. And again, Kevin probably said we reached a low point in the nineties where we were relegated to Division Two. Again, I was only five or six, so I'm not even sure the ins and outs of it. But early in early in the nineties, I think it was ninety, uh, we won the championship in ninety three, I think, and then we we're maybe relegated in ninety four or ninety five. And they sat down as a juvenile committee, and the the boys have just mentioned there a couple of minutes ago, put a structure together. And all of that iron, all iron team, or at least ninety percent of that all iron team, came through that structure. So we, we reached a low point in the early mid nineties, and we came back, you know, fifteen or twenty years later in an all Ireland. You know, at the minute we're probably starting out on that journey again, but we have a lot of work to do. And Kevin's right in, in terms of when you reach a high, it's and you've worked for it for years, you automatically sort of. I don't know if it agree with Kevin where we went downhill automatically or straight away. I think we sort of plateaued for maybe two or three years and stayed at the same level and then gradually started really going downhill. But, you know, it's it's just like taking your eye off the ball. Like I remember reading Christy O'Connor's book about Six Mile Bridge and the hurling. They won the All-Ireland. And now, 10 years later, they were playing Division 2 or Division 3 hurling in, in, in Clare because... You think at the time you only focus on the on the present, and we sort of forgot about our juvenile structures and uh, and a number of other things, and that that's having an impact now. If you understand me, now thankfully, um, we've a, we had a good under sixteen team that won the county championship last year, which uh, again our, our our own brother took, and we had a nephew playing on it as well. So. Yes, there is small signs. We we had a decent enough on the twelve team there that have won a couple of leagues and championships. But yeah. in general, yes, we could be in a better place as a club. But I say every club has its ups and downs, and every club, uh, you know, you can't. When when people speak to me about it now, you're sort of going, Do you know what? It was such an achievement for that team to win thirteen or fourteen championships in sort of fourteen or fifteen years. You know, a bit like Calvin Gales, or it is so hard to stay at the top. You know, because you do get motiv- demotivated, it gets born, blah, blah, blah. You know, but for us to stay at the top for 14 or 15 years as a, as a group of players was some achievement. Yeah. John, you know can, I, can, I, can I just say as well, maybe the other issue that St. Gauls as a club face, and I think this is a really important point that people don't see about clubs like St. Gauls or maybe Schlock Neil or a lot of other clubs now are coming along. We've been a duo club for a long, long time, John, and there's sort of there is in the background this nice, if you want to put it that way, sometimes can get boisterous uh, fight for the hearts and minds of players whether somebody's going to commit that year to hurling or to football. Now we have a good core group of lads who do both, but you know it it does seem to be that when the hurling goes well, then the football maybe isn't going as well, and 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 vice versa. So. In terms of that, our club isn't unique up and down Ireland, but you will see that if you talk to people in maybe Slough Neil or Kilmacud um, or any other dual club, that there is that issue there with players as well, that they do get demotivated, they do get the uh, training, training, you know, becomes maybe three, four, five times a week. You know, players will just, they'll automatically, there'll be a plateau, there'll be a time when they want to take time out, you know, and that's something that we face that maybe some other clubs, maybe the likes of Cross, Maybe some of the Tyrone clubs don't face is that that fight for the dual player. Yeah, yeah. Of course, this podcast is sponsored by OrgoRetro.com. Check the website for all your retro gear needs. And I suppose Kevin, we were we were talking about it last night off air, and I suppose the Ulster Club Championship, and you said some great battles with Calvin Gales, um, you know, at a, at a club near me, and uh, you and Nicholas Walsh uh, went toe to toe a few times. <laughs> yeah, myself and Nicholas have been had a few Joshua Fury. <laughs> um, exchanges. Um, let's just say that all friendly and above board. No, Nicholas was a guy that when you were travelling down to 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 Braffney or he was coming to Casement, you always knew in the back of your mind you're up against a good, physical, strong player who would give you a hundred percent. You know, you were going to come out of the game with bumps and bruises. But listen, there wasn't anything below the board about Nicholas. You know, he was a tough, tough individual. Um. And I was speaking to him not so long ago, actually, on Instagram. And, you know, John, it's always great to see somebody you played against 
giving back to the game. And, you know, Nicholas himself and the way he's going about things, hopefully, I would hope one day that maybe Nicholas could come home and take up a job in Crook Park he, his, for what he's doing in terms of coaching, strength and conditioning and all of that. So it's great to see Nicholas doing well. Um, it was a real honour to play against boys like him, like Shawnee Johnson, like Michael Ling. You know, Calvin Gales had a very, very good side. In fact, arguably... They should have beat us that year in 2010 in Braffney Park. We were very lucky to get out of there. Um, they, I think they give us a pasting maybe a year before in 09 in, case, uh, in casement. They come up to casement and give us a real pasting. Um, I think Mick O'Dowd maybe was over them at that stage. They had a real good, strong group of players. And, you know, we're talking about looking back on regrets. I haven't spoke to Shawnee in maybe a year or so. So if you were speaking to him, he might say that, you know, Calvin Gales maybe regretted that they didn't make more of the club championship finals than yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, super. I always say that to Martin Dunn and Shawnee. The, the, the Ulster club championship always did elude them and they had a, a panel 110% capable of winning the Kevin. So it always did amaze me over the years. It amazed everyone in Calvin. And we always did say you should really give the Ulster club a good run after winning all them 50 county championships. Um, but uh, obviously, CJ yourself, Ulster club championship, you know, great times for the St. Gauls. Yeah, the Ulster Club was something special in our club, you know, I suppose, again, going right back to the beginning of our conversations, talking about my dad's team, and their team would have been special, and, and, and won the Ulster Club, and then we're beating the final of the Ulster Club, so we always called the Ulster Club, when, when, when we won Antrim, then we were going to Europe, that's the way we sort of called it, and you could tell it was Ulster Club week within that group of players, because um, once you sort of won the county championship training, went up a notch or two in terms of physicality in terms of the football and the ability of the group you knew that you know we needed to concentrate a bit more because the Ulster club was something special but look um the sort of the 07 08 you know cross beat as an 07 you know but we're there they're about for say five or six years and uh, we really came seasoned campaigners in it and you know kevin was talking about bumps and bruises there from nicholas Walsh and stuff but I suppose any Ulster club match you played, like the Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, well, for my body anyway, um, speaking for myself, were a complete disaster. You know, just trying to heavy legs, bad pitches, bumps and bruises, aches, whatever it happened to be. So I, I would say, you know, and I said this before, that the all Iron club's probably the hardest competition to win. Yeah. And I would say the Ulster club's probably the second hardest because there was a lot of good teams in it back then. Like you had Ballandary, who again... Ballandary beat us in 01, I think it was, Kevin, was that right? And they went, and we should have beat them. But pretty similar to us and Kevin Gales a number of years later, which Kevin just spoke about. But we should have, we had Ballandary on the ropes in casement, and they went on to win the All Ireland that year. So, um, you know, 01, but we were only a sort of new team on the block at that stage. But Ulster Club was really hard competition. You had Ballandary at the crosses. Um, Mill Bridge were an our fantastic outfit, you know, that Benny Coulter and boys like that. And we beat them in Uri a couple of times and they were a tough team. Um, you'd also then later on sort of coming towards 2010, 11, kill coup, you know, but I say towards the end, Contiburate were an our team that were there, thereabouts. So there were six or seven really seasoned campaign teams in it. We're now, you know, there's nearly in most counties, there's different winner nearly each year. So I don't think the Ulster Club is as tough as it was back in them early sort of mid two thousands, where there was six or seven really really class teams in it that mm. you know could beat anyone on any given day. Yeah, yeah, John. I mean, if you go back there and look at some of them in 04, in the Ulster Club Championship, some guys played Carrickmore, Mayo Bridge, and Balahi. Um, and I marked Connor Gormley, Benny Coulter, and David O'Neill in three separate weeks. Now. If you do want to learn as a footballer, develop as a footballer, pit yourself as a, uh, against the best as a footballer, three weeks in a row, that was the sort of opposition that you had, you know. And, you know, Benny or, or Conor Gormley or David O'Neill would be the first to tell you, they were only, you know, one player in, in, inside good sides that Carrick Moore and Blahy had. And, you know, these were tough teams in tough conditions. And, you know, for me, the Ulster Club has gone down a wee bit the last couple of years. The only team that I can really say... The quality of team, if you look at uh, Trillick from Tyrone, they have six or seven really, really quality footballers. But to get out of the Tyrone Championship is obviously very difficult for them. 
But they, that that sort of caliber of a team is what you were having maybe between 03 and, and 2010. It wasn't about one player or two players. They were coming along up against teams that had four, five, six, seven county footballers um, from from Division One teams like Armagh or Tyrone or Derry. So that was, mm-hmm. you learned your footballer and you learned it the hard way. And, you know, there's many days you rolled out of maybe Newry or Celtic Park or, or, or Oman, you know, you learned your lesson. But uh, they're the days that you remember more than, no disrespect to it, more than Anthem Championship days, is the days that you played against teams like that. Yeah, definitely. It's known that Conor Gormley has all his all stars playing against you, Kevin. But, uh, <laughs> but um, <laughs> what about this Cross and Glen juggernaut, um, Kevin? You would have came up with got against us uh, over the years. So, what was it like to kind of come up against them over the years? Like, because obviously watching on, they were just seriously impressive uh, team to watch. Yeah, well, the first time we came across them, I think was 07, Connor. Yeah, oh, the fan. Yeah, yeah. Now. We talk about the Ulster Club there so much, John. I, I, maybe people who can watch this can maybe look up the figure. I think there was eighteen or 19,000 people in Uri that day for the Ulster Club final. It was something serious. Um, and I remember the build-up to the game. Paul Paul Duffin from Castle Wellman was managing some goals. And he was, in a way, Paul was a really good manager in that he let the players take the lead, really. Um, so the players were sort of the driving force behind it. But at that stage, and I don't mean this in any disrespect to, to any of the teams that we had played against previously, we were really in clu- cruise control. We were almost at the height of our power. We had guys like Angel Gallagher were really coming to the fore then. Kevin Niblock really coming to the fore. And I remember getting into that game, and I think at the time I was writing a, an article for the Gaelic Life, and I pitted it something like against the, the, old, the old lady against the new juggernaut. And really, the old lady that day, Muhammad Ali, rope doped us because just before halftime, Ajo had buried a goal. We, I think we had gone in two points up. We really thought we had them. Um, and I remember reading Joe, Brody, Joe Brawley's article the following week. He says he had met Joe Kernan under the main stand at Newry, and Kernan had told him the match is over. The wise old men will take these new boys. And Furness, Oshin done what Oshin does. He stepped up. I think he hit maybe one, two in the second half. Yeah. But that was the thing about Cross, you know, they had so many, people talk about them, they were a great team, but they had great individual players as well that didn't maybe get the credit as individuals. Yeah. Um, they were, you know, they were built as well for Ulster Club football, you know, the two Mac and T boys were just, you know, they could possibly be Hollywood superheroes, you know, the size of them, you know, they were just man mountains. France, Francie Bailey didn't take no crap as we know, you know, John Donaldson was hanging around maybe for that final, guys like that. David McKenna played, who was a very good underrated player. So, you know, that day in Newry, they were just far too cute for us. And uh, as I say, we came away that day. We went in, really fancied our chances. And we left with our tail between our legs. So yeah. that's that's that was a learning day, learning curve. And, you know, I have nothing but the highest respect for Cross as a team and as a group of players, you know. They are the benchmark, and they will always continue to be the benchmark for any other club in Ulster. Yeah, I agree with all that. What about yourself, CJ? Yeah, look, they are they are the benchmark, I suppose. Without you know, without going into them too much, they were probably the group that we tried to to try to chase, I suppose. Um, without mentioning their name every week or being obsessed with them and saying, "Oh, we need to be," we we, we sort of knew that that's the benchmark we were trying to get to, and. Probably the first opportunity we got was, as say Kevin says, 07, and we fancied his chances. But look, it, it, it was put beautifully over Kevin because I, I, I'm a big believer in this that we probably snooped past a couple of teams in the Ulster Club because of our cuteness. But it was because they, we were there for six or seven years. You know, so I think you have to be in the competition for a couple of years to actually understand how to be cute and get over the lane. You know, it, you know, might be. You know, turn it on with 15 minutes to go, or it may be, you know, taking control and keeping the ball at the right times instead of getting forward and trying to break. You know, it's about conserving energy in the Ulster Club when you're tired. And, you know, it, it's just, you know, it, you know, even, you know, trying to slow down freeze, slow down kickouts, whatever it happens to be in the Ulster Club, it takes a couple of years to actually learn to win games um, because it's totally different from a, from a sort of 
county championship where even when you're four or five points up, you're still kickouts normal, blah, blah, blah. So it takes that wee bit and, and cross where an exceptional team, you know, Kevin missed a couple of names, but like you still had Clark, you had Aaron Kernan, you had Tony Kernan, you had Stephen Kernan, you know, boys that probably were, obviously Clark and um, Aaron Kernan were very well respected, but like Stephen Kernan done a hell of a job for them, Tony Kernan off the ground from 45s. We, every point counts in the Ulster Club, and they had boys that were just sort of able to step up to the mark at the right time, like, and they are the benchmark, the will, not only for teams in Ulster, but for teams in Ireland, they're trying to, you know, catch records and stuff like that, but they were probably the club that we were looking to chase for a long time without actually mentioning their name every week yeah. or focusing on them too much. Yeah, yeah, super. And I suppose we can we can move on to your county, uh, Ange and Kevin. Um, you know, with the highs and lows and everything came with it. But uh, do you want to uh, touch on Antrim and uh, what it meant to you for breaking on to the Antrim setup uh, back when you were a nipper? Yeah, I suppose at the time, you know, I broke on in 03, I think, or oh, maybe, sorry, maybe 01, 02. Um, actually, my, my debut was against Calvin in the championship. Um, I think that day I was getting beat up by Anthony Ford for a long time um, in casement. So, um, as an good player, Calvin Gill said. Yeah, yeah. DJ, yeah. Anthony was Anthony was a very good player. If you were playing at wing forward and he was at wing back, he was probably trying to make you go back as much as possible. He, he liked to to go forward with the ball. He was, he was a very fit player, um, very honest player. Um, maybe too honest, Anthony, but. Uh, <laughs> No, that was really. I came into the squad then. I was I was in the Queen Sigerson panel at the time, and we had boys like Philip Jordan and and uh, Justin McNulty and Cormac McAnallen. So I was learning my trade very quickly in around there. You know, you were going up to the dub on a Saturday morning. You were getting chinned by Cormac or chinned by Justin McNulty, and there was there was no rest for the wicked. Um, so you were learning very quickly. The club were starting to come good. So that was, you know, it was getting a good run out, good football there. And then the county came calling. I think we won the club championship 01. I played quite well that year. And PJ O'Hare was our uh, club manager. I felt really sorry, John, for PJ. He came into the Anthem job. And it was, I suppose the only way to describe PJ being in the Anthem job was um, he, he was... Albert Einstein, trying to teach theoretical physics to kindergarten. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I absolutely felt sorry for him. Now, this is, John, this is 2001 or 2002. Now, we had Sean McGreevy, who was in goal for us, right? A superb shot stopper. who had a great kick out. And again, I'll, I'll repeat, this is 2001. PJ was thinking at that stage about how he could get his goalkeeper up to kick points from 50 yards, maybe 12, 13 years before it was actually done. So we, we came to a match one day and PJ had the whole match talk and this is what's going to happen and this is what you to do, this is what you to do, this is what you to do. So we're playing against Louth anyway and the ball was thrown up and I think Joe Quinn won it and Marty McCarry, big Marty McCarry was coming through anyway and he got dragged down. So I ran out anyway to take the free as PJ had asked me. Kevin Madden come over and push me. He he was then intimating to hit the free. Then Kevin uh, Brady come over to push him. And by that time, we'd wasted enough time to get Sean McGreevy up to kick over a 40-yard point, get us started well off. McGreevy was too busy looking at some girl up in the Andersonstown flats, you know. And as we were going up the tunnel at half time, PJ was just shaking his head, going to me, you know, is it really worth it? He was a guy... His communication skills could have been better, don't get me wrong, but he was a guy well ahead of his time. It was a great lesson in Gillick football for me, from him. He had a superb brain. He always used to talk to you about, you know, there's no law to say you can't carry the ball backwards. He was all about ball retention. Yeah. You know, he was a guy well ahead of his time. Unfortunately, you know, his audience was not captivating. Um, so it was a great start for me. PJ was someone that my father had grown up with and he was very loyal to me and I really enjoyed that first couple of years there. Um, but I suppose, John, not to be controversial about it, it very quickly came to my, atten my attention. When you were playing with Queens on a Saturday or you were playing with Gauls on a Sunday and the way you were being treated was exceptional. 
you know, Queens was just. It was like another world for me. I'd never seen any, a team being treated like this. You had people like John McCluskey who had been involved. You know, you, you were like an, an American scholarship athlete, really. Um, and then going with goals, and they were treating you really well as well. You know, everything was about the player. Everything was focused on the team. And then you went to Antrim, and it was, it was just, it was all down hell. You know, you were doing, as Connor said earlier about a player, you were going to Queens or Jordanstown or Mary Peters track. You were absolutely knocking your pan in four nights a week. And then you were being treated like a dog, you know, and you were just asking yourself, was it really worth it? And it wasn't. And, you know, people criticized you then because you walked off panels or you were controversial. You'd done this, you'd done that. And that's fair enough. You know, they want to go and support the county. They're paying good money. I have no problem with that. But they didn't really know what's going on behind the doors, John. And unfortunately, they still don't. Um, and, you know, Antrim have very much yo-yoed between Division 3 and 4 for the, for the better part of 20 years because the same problems are reoccurring. And, you know, there was good times with Antrim, don't get me wrong. Liam Bradley, when he came in, I came in 2011, we had a real good run in the team. Um, you know, Brock Kildare a replay. Baker had his feelings. Don't get me wrong, but he was a terrific motivator. Boys sort of wanted to buy in and play with, play for him, you know. Um, and, you know, that year was a real good experience as well for us. Um, but generally, it's a feeling of negativity. Could I have been better in the way I conducted myself? Absolutely. Did I always... Um, put my full heart and soul into it. No, not the way I did with St. Gauls or with Queens at that time because I was being treated very well there. They were, you know, that was important. And um, I suppose they were successful as well, them teams. And when you get success, you want to stick with that group. You want to buy into that. You want to put as much as you can into it. It's very difficult, John, for, for me to describe to anybody how to go to Waterford, at 12 o'clock on a Saturday afternoon for a whole bus a whole bus ride down to stay overnight, to get up the next day, to play against Waterford in a Division 4 football match in the middle of February. You know, I'd have more motivation to climb Kilimanjaro than to do that, you know? So that's just the way where I was coming from. People are listen to this and not like it. That's up to them. I wanted to play for a winning team. I wanted to play for guys that were equally as committed. I wanted to play for guys that were treating us right. And that just wasn't happening at times. Yeah, yeah. Oh, all of a sudden, we're trying to catch me bread after all that. But um, I suppose, Kevin, like, what um, what kind of professionalism maybe did you want to see brought into the Antrim setup to maybe make it that bit more enjoyable? Because if it was so enjoyable with college, what do you feel could be brought into the Antrim setup, uh, Kevin? Um, it was just small things. I mean, I can give you two very small examples. A guy used to pick me up to go to training shames with her. Lovely man, absolute gentleman. And he was sort of like the team logistics guy. So one day I arrived and I went and said to him, Seamus, you know, I was rushing out of the house. Sorry, I should have been ready. And I haven't got any shorts. So this was a National League match at home. Now, Seamus went to get me a pair of shorts. And all of a sudden there was a kerfuffle because one of the county board officers wouldn't give him a pair of shorts. So at one stage, I was walking out to the pitch in a pair of some golf shorts, because one of the other lads for Scalds had brought up an extra pair for the warm-up. I'd basically forgotten the shorts, and the county board officer said he wasn't getting a pair of shorts. This trip I just told you about the Waterford, I'll never forget this. So PJ was the manager. So we leave Saturday, Waterford, we're playing Waterford, it's a... It's a camel, two-day camel ride down there. Um, we go down anyway, and uh, we all sit down for a meal. So myself, Kevin Brady, and Darn O'Hare are the last three to get served. But there's no more chicken dinners left because three members of the county board have got the chicken dinners. Now, if you had put them three out of full forward the next day, they wouldn't have been kicking too many points for you, but they were more important than the three of us were. So, I mean, we had to wait half an hour. I mean, at one stage, we we're going to go out and order a curry fried rice, you know, from the local Chinese. You know, uh, an absolute, you know, madness. Absolute madness. And I'll give, you a, I'll give you a last, quickly funny story about this. Kevin Brady was our GPA rep. 
loveliest lad in the world. Brady could actually be Secretary General of the UN if he wanted, because he's that nice. He's such a good guy. Everybody gets on with him. Real, real tremendous lad, really good footballer. But they come into the team board dead at one time with these pair of football boots that we're all getting for the year. And I think they were pulled out of your swap shop that you have online. You know, they offered these, these pair of football boots and they were adamant that we were getting them. You know, they didn't even consult us. They just threw it at us as if there was a piece of dirt. And, you know, Brady wasn't really going to challenge things because, as I say, he was a real good lad and, you know, he was just there concentrating his football. But the way that you just treated it was over a long period of time was just, it was horrendous. And, you know, people say, ah, oh, but you just get up and you get on with it. That wasn't the case at Queen's. That wasn't the case at, at St. Gauls. You know, you got, you know, I hurt my, I, I damaged my leg badly at one stage within within four to five hours, four or five individuals in St. Gauls had cowboyed up the money out of their own pockets for me to go and get a scan, you know, because that was important to them. Treating the players was important to them. And I'm sure, I know for a fact, there was other players in St. Gauls down through the years that got the same treatment. And, you know, we were the most important thing to the people in the club. We were the most important thing to the people in the university. And, you know, then playing for Queens was just a, a whole new experience to me when I was when I was 20, 21. It was day and night apart from, from what Anthem was. And uh, I look forward every Wednesday to go on to train in McQueen's to put in my whole effort there because, you know, you were going on a Thursday night uh, county training. It wasn't anywhere nearly as good, you know. <laughs> I've never been to that. Oh, that's brilliant stuff. That's brilliant. A lot of good sign bites and that. And I suppose, if at all, Kevin, maybe saying the Ulster Championship maybe warm summer stay in Caseman Park, did Kevin McGurdy play, enjoy playing for Antrim? Yeah. Um, them days there you look forward to. So certainly playing in, we played Tyrone and Armagh back to back in 03. We gave them both a good game. Um, we played Tyrone again maybe 2010. Um, and it was a sunny day and them sort of things. Yeah, there was a good crowd in Casement Park. Yeah, there was a real good atmosphere. Don't get me wrong. That's, you know, players want to play there, but. I think, John, a stat that might shock you is I don't think me, Connor, and Kieran have ever played on the same Antrim team. Jeez. Never. Yeah. Uh, I don't. I think maybe me and Connor played one match together. One. I think it might have been that tone match, was it? They beat us by four points. It's the only time we ever played on the same Antrim team. That's, so. Yeah. God. <sighs> Yeah, 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 that, that probably speaks volumes. And uh, I don't know if Sage, you're the best man to answer why do you feel that might have been. Um, look, again, how do you, how do you better that? But look, the, the simple way to put it, and again, without being overly negative and whatever, the, the proof is in the pudding, right? The, the answers are there for everyone to see. Antrim football has been in Division 4, Division 3 for the last 20 years. You can use whatever excuses you want. You can use um, players of the problem, you can use county poor, but generally there is something wrong. And unless we as a county can fix it, or has there been an inquest or whatever you want, and uh, right here's what we think's going wrong, right, we'll try and fix that and see how it works. But generally it just it just floats along and floats along, and that's why it's never ever um, improved. And don't get me wrong, I think Autumn lost out because there was a generation of players there. The match we just spoke about with Throne, that there was four points in it. That was a Throne team coming off the back of a couple of irons in 08 and 05 that had still had a lot of them playing. But, you'd, you know, you'd, you'd obviously like so Sean Kelly, Kevin, uh, you know, Mick McCann, James Lockery, boys that Antrim, you know, just don't have anymore. That mm. There was seven or eight very, very good quality players in that Antrim team that could have graced any team. You know, a couple of Cargan boys, a couple of St. Gauls, you know, the likes of James Lockery, as I say, there was a couple of maybe Port Benone boys in and around there that were really, really good. And it showed, that, again, the proof was in the pudding, brought an unbelievable drone team to four points because of the talent. But it's just that, it comes right, look, it just, you were, like, I see it up here in drone, like the way you're treated, you know, if you go to coach a team, they try and, you know, it's thank you, it's what can I do for you, do you need X, do you need Y and equipment or whatever it is. But just with Autumn and 
again, I don't know what it is with Waterford, but we went down to Waterford one night, um, and again, Tony Scullion, who a lot of people say some goals and Corgan had problems. Uh, Tony was one of the best people, and Kevin, I'll, I'll say that as well, that Tony Scullion was a, an absolute legend of a fella, and me and Chris Kerr were students at the time, and Tony was obviously doing very well for himself and work, but we, we got down to Waterford, and after six or seven or a four-day camel ride or whatever Kevin called it was that <laughs> we got a bowl of soup on a roll and we left at 12 o'clock in the day and we're down there at seven and that was all we got. So Tony says, do you know what? We went out for a down there, just the three of us, and we sat down and we had a Chinese. Yeah. And in fairness to Tony, and the, no word of a lie, Tony paid for it. And he says, you boys are students. He says, don't worry about it. And the next week, we're down again playing at Kent, can't remember, it was Limerick or somewhere, somewhere very close to there, stay in the same hotel, same thing, round to the Chinese, Tony Scullion again bought me and Kerr Chinese, and we sat in, we had the crack in the Chinese, but that's what the, that's the treatment you were dealing with, now I think it's slightly improved, from what I know in the last three or four years, but that's what we were dealing with when you were back playing in sort of the mid 2000s, when you, you heard our mad teams and throne teams, and yeah, all these teams were getting treated properly that you were going and like i remember honest to god went to, went to went back to Antrim. can't even remember what year it was maybe it was, it was just when dinsilly was built right and i walked into the silly and i was about five or ten months before train actually started and i walked up and i says look uh mate what what change room with the senior footballers in and he says there's no change room for you and I says, what? Oh, he says, oh, there's a camogie match here. No problem. Down, we're playing Antrim in the camogie, so they obviously need two changing rooms. Yeah. And and the Antrim Town, St. Congol's Antrim team, who were a club team, were training, so they had another changing room, and there's no changing room for the county senior footballers. Now, that was only three or four years ago. And, like I say, I don't know the ins and outs of it, but Tonsilly has three pitches, which is Antrim training ground, and has four changing rooms. Now to me, three pitches with three matches going on is six different teams. So does it not make sense that you need six changing rooms? So just wee small things like that that could have been improved greatly. But I say un until Antrim do something or, you know, again, look, you can knock on the door and you can have 30 committed players and and training every night, and but when you're up against obstacles, where where are you training? Like Antrim train in Jordanstown, yeah. At the minute, or or before Dunsilly, again Dunsilly was built. There's no there's no floodlights, so the county football season happens in the winter when you need floodlights, right? So there's no floodlights. So you train at Jordanstown, Jordanstown pull the pitch at four o'clock, then you're suddenly looking for other training grounds, and at six or six or half six some nights you're looking, you don't even know where you're training, you know, and that that it. It's wee small things like that that can frustrate you and people maybe don't know the end as Kevin said the inside knowledge of all these things but there is talent in Antrim there's no doubt about it they have a big scope of you know uh, you know they have a big population so why are we in division three and four of the football league every year there's something that right and I'm not saying it's the county board I'm not saying it's players there's there's something that's not linking up and until you do a bit of research and find out what it is how you meant to improve the problem. Yeah. I suppose, Kevin, like, how do Antrim uh, expect to kind of go on as a, like a county if they kind of treat, like, have, treat the players like that? And how, do, how, how can they sustain players over a broad scheme of things, Kevin? You can't, John. That's the simple thing. You can't do it in the way that they're treating players. I mean, you know, apparently a guy went up one day in, K in Casement Park and for the big matches, he wanted to bring his burger van in. And the county board said to him, not a problem, you can bring your burger van in as long as you take the under-21 hurlers. You know, so he was he was wanted a burger van, and on top of that, instead of somebody getting rallies, they got the under-21 hurling job. You know, this is the sort of madness that was going on. And Connor's right, it probably has changed a wee bit. It has changed forward, but how do you develop it? Look, it's not rocket science, this. Some goals in their own plan in the 1990s showed this. Um, I suppose the best way I describe it to people is how do you build a house? You identify a site, you get in the groundworks and you build from the groundworks up. You don't try and put the roof on. So my my analogy there is don't concentrate on the Atom senior footballers at the minute. 
concentrate on what we're doing in primary school and what we're doing in our clubs and what we're doing then moving forward. Now, there's good kids there. We want them senior football team at the minute, the likes of, you know, Patrick McBride and James McCauley and, and kids like that. And they're committed. And, you know, unfortunately, for 20 years, it hasn't changed and they'll, be, they'll still be treated the same. So what we have to ensure is that a generation on in 20 years time, that that is not the case. And, you know, take away the funds from the senior football team as much as possible that you can. Reinvest in the youth, work with the youth, have good coaching structures, build good coaches, which is another vital thing. And I think, you know, Martin McHugh said this a number of years ago on, I think it was on the BBC Championship, and he was 100% right when he was talking about Cavan, your own county. He, he said, you know, it was time that Cavan went away and started concentrating on club football and making club football in Cavan much more um, competitive. And that would ensure that if more clubs were competitive and doing more good work, then Cavan would have um, Cavan would have you know a, a good group of players to pick from, and you know they went away and done that. And it's it, it, you know Cavan are also champions at the minute. Five, six, seven years ago, not even Cavan won their first McCrory Cup in in quite a while. They were quite competitive at minors and under twenty ones for a while, and all of a sudden now at senior they have that group of players. You build from the bottom up. You invest in the structures at the bottom. You invest in coaches who are that. You invest in your schools. And unfortunately, I still don't believe that we've got the right formula to do that. But this isn't going to be an overnight thing. It's going to be a 20 to 25 year plan. Again, look at another Ulster County. Very, very easy to look at. Look at Tyrone. You know, good in Ireland, final 86 for the first time. Really, Tyrone then takes a big, big jump from that. People are all of a sudden more and more interested in the GAA. The schools are doing more and more work. They get a real bounce off the back of that. Then that minor team come, what, a generation later, 97, 98, you know, and then all of a sudden, a 10 years later, they've got two All-Irelands in the back. You mm -hmm. know, that's how you do it. It's over a period of time. It's not going to come overnight. It's not going to come with one group of players. If you look at the St. Gauls team that won the 2010 All-Ireland Final, that is the combination, I would say, of nine different underage teams in St. Gauls. Nine. Mm -hmm. Because you got guys that were 33, right down to guys that were 18 on that panel. So they had played, you know, different year groups. So it takes time. It takes constant work. It takes a good plan. It takes investment. And... You know, there are some things going right in Antrim, you know, their their communication's really good. They've started this Saffron Business Forum, which looks to be doing a decent bit of work, you know. But moving forward, hopefully, you know, people will come with a, a decent plan and that the generation the next generation of kids will have something that they can, you know, they can work towards. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. but you, you look at Antrim's minor and under twenty one results over the past 20 years, all right? And then you'll see that there's, I, I would say there's maybe three wins in Maynard over 20 years, and there's maybe three wins at under 21 in 20 years. So how are you meant to compete at senior level? It's a bit like Kevin says, St. Pat's Cavan was, who was man of the match? Um, was Thomas Galligan that man of the match in the McCrory Cup final? Thomas Edward Donahue. Or Thomas O'Donoghue, yeah. Thomas Galligan played in that team. He came on as a sub, but I think he was injured. He came on, yeah, yeah. yeah. And now he's playing in the cabin senior team at midfield. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. he went through the school system. They won a McCrory. They got successful. He got a, a bit, like Kevin said, he got a Queen's. He got a <clears> wee <throat> bit of scope for it and believed in himself. Then I, I would say that team went on and they beat Tyrone a couple of times, I think, in under 21s. And Donegal, they were playing Murphy's team in, in finals. So they're yeah. competing against the Donegals, they were competing against the Thrones. Yeah. So it's only natural that in three or four years' time, which is now, that they were going to be, I'm not saying winning, but they were going to be competing against these big counties because they were competing at minor, they were competing at school level, and they were competing at under 21. So you can't just jump ship the senior and go, oh my God, we've lost the last 10 under 21s and 10 minors. Please, God, we'll be good at senior. It just doesn't work that way. You have to work through the schools, the minors, and the under 21s. And if you look at every county, I would say the majority, Antrim and Fermanagh, who, who struggle as well, have the worst records at minor and under 21.
Yeah, yeah, spot on. And I suppose like, the current state of affairs as well, Kevin, um, Dublin's dominance and everything that goes with it. And you are saying at the start of the podcast you weren't enjoying the current state of affairs. And like, is, that, is, is the gap closing at all, do you feel, Kevin? Or are the Dubs just going to dominate for the next five or six years? Uh, I think they'll dominate for the next four or five years, definitely. Um, look, the only team that's going to get near them in terms of quality is is either Donegal or, or Kerry. Um and the thing about Donegal and Kerry is, what I love about them at the minute is, they're the only two that aren't complaining about the Dubs' dominance. They're actually trying actively to do something about it on the pitch. We hear all this crying. Look, the Dubs have what they have. I'm no fan of the Dubs, nor will I ever be. I was at UCD for about 18 months, and I played with a lot of these Dublin players. Mm-hmm. So the likes of Keno Sullivan, the likes of Mick Savage, the likes of uh, Michael Fitzsimons, you know, them sorts of guys, they're tremendous footballers. You know, all credit to the Dubs. Give them the credit where it's due. They've raised the bar. They've asked Kerry serious questions. They've asked Donegal serious questions. And you know what? I fully expect Kerry to come to the table in the next two or three years with some answers to them questions. Um, yes, it's not it's not a competitive championship anymore outside of them three or four teams. You can fire Tyrone in there as well because, look, they do have an abundance of talent. New management, maybe things might change. They might have more expansive game. Um, but, you know, I give the Dubs lots of credit. Um, and I say it's up the others to, to start to challenge that. Um, Kerry have big issues that they need the answer. They have probably, pound for pound, the best front seven or eight in the game going forward, arguably. The problem is in defence. They still don't seem to have sorted that out. Donegal, maybe too over reliant on maybe like Russian Lanahan, players like that, Ram McHugh. They need one or two more to step forward. They maybe need one or two new players to come in and inject a bit of um in fact inject a new bit of emphasis to scoring going forward. I mean, I love what Cormac Costello has done, I love what Colin Vasquez has done, what they have brought to Dublin. You know, they're giving the manager real options and, and other counties need to do that. But the product's not good, John. It's not because of the dubs. It's because of the rules. And that's the problem. There was a, 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 a Eugene McGee, I think, headed up a rules committee three, four, five years ago, maybe a bit longer than that. I had wrote to that committee about a number of different changes. For example, uh, and this is something in our house we know a bit about, in seven-a-side football, when you go over the opposition's half into that half, you can't go back into your own half. So the emphasis is on attacking play. There also could be down, I would like to see the game go to 13 a side. Mm -hmm. It opens up more space in the pitch, less space then for uh, people to cheat, as I call it, this this sweeper. Um, So there's more space in the pitch. There's less people to uh, cheat. And I would also want two referees um, because I think a lot of defenders are getting away with off the ball pulling, um, and stuff like that. We need to have an emphasis on forward play. Why do people want to buy ringside tickets to basketball in America? Because it's all action. There's plenty of scoring. Um, it's enthralling. And our game isn't enthralling. And it's because not because of the dubs. It's because of the rules. And CJ, yourself, what's your take on the current state of affairs? Yeah, I think, uh, look... I think Kevin has a lot of points there in terms of the, the right way. Now, I think it has opened up a little bit. Are starting to get a little bit more scores and whatever else. Was, but was that just because the year that was in it, the teams, you know, um, sort of weren't as fit or whatever, and there was more kick passing? I'm not sure. But definitely over the last four or five years, and definitely at club level, and I spoke about this with you before, is managers at club level are getting big, big money and they're scared to lose. So what they do, they try and lo- not lose the match first instead of actually going and trying to win the game from the start. You know, so they sit back, they sit back, and then they try and, they try and sort of pinch you with the last sort of 10, 15 minutes instead of actually starting out the game and saying, you know what, we're going to take it to you, and we're going to try and score 30 points. And if you score 28, we're going to try and score 30 or 31 to win the match. And I think that's why Hurling's so good. All right, we're talking about the Hurling and the sweeper and... Yes, Hurling is playing a wee bit of one sweeper sometimes, but Limerick, pound for pound, cornerbacks mark corner forwards. End of story. Old school Hurling. 
Now, they will adapt if they have to, do the same off or whatever. But you look at the amount of scores in Hurling compared to football. And I know it's a different game. It's faster. The bugs up and down the end. More. But too much hand passing side to side. Too much, too slow and laboured. It is hard to watch at times. Um, but it's even harder to watch when you go to... And I, I go to club matches in Armagh. I go to club matches in Throne, Antrim to watch, to play. And all you see is 12 men behind the ball and going... You, you nearly want to go home after five minutes. You know, because... You know, you know what exactly what the next fifty minutes is. They're going to try and clog it up, clog it up, and then hit you in the break with ten minutes to go. And it seems to be a common trend. And I think it's because managers are getting paid big money and don't want to lose games and want to stay in the job. It's near become a wage, and that's yeah. being honest. Instead, of actually, where managers were sort of old school, a manager from within your own club, maybe going, Do you know what, I'm not getting paid anything. Let's go and try and win the match. Mm-hmm. You know, so I think a lot of managers are are saying right. If I'm sort of, if I'm a sort of some goals now, and I'm sort of third or fourth or fifth or sixth, whatever it happens to be, best team in the county now, and I'm going up against county champions such as Cargan, let's play defensively so you know I can stay in the job for next year, and we only get be a bad point or two. I think a lot of managers are happy to do that at a lot of clubs in a lot of different counties, and that's why it's so defensive. And I think. We need to sort of change that. I don't know whether it's in the rules that you're only allowed, you know, certain money in each half or whatever it is, but hopefully that the kick pass needs to come into it. There needs to be more scores in games. There maybe needs to be more goals. And that's why Dublin are so good. They score yeah. regularly. They score regularly. That's why you can't beat them. Yeah. They're scoring, I think it was an average of 20 or 23 points a game last year. Yeah. If you're scoring 23 points a game, you're going to win every match now. So that's what the Dubs have said. They said, look, you play 10 behind the ball, 12, we don't care. We're always going to attack you because if we get 23 scores, if we concede 116, we'll still beat you. And that's why they're that's why they're winning. Yeah, yeah. John, just a, one more point on that. I mean, if we look at possibly the two best, Ulster's two most successful counties outside of Cavan in the recent year, of Down and Tyrone. You name that Tyrone front six, right? Durr's the only one that you would have a question mark over being able to kick regular points. Every one of the rest of them was a forward who was doing his first job first was to keep the scoreboard ticking. You look at down in the 90s, right? You've Blaney on one side, you've Mason on the other side. Uh, sorry, you've Blaney in the middle, you've Carr on one side, you've Mason on the other side, you've Lyndon and McCartan, and then you've Aidan Farrell or Whitnell, whichever one. All of them scoring regularly. First job is to score. First job is not to run back behind the ball. First job is to score. You know, and unfortunately, you know, that, that was the 90s and then into the 2000s. Still the case now. As a forward, you should be coming off the pitch and saying, look, how many did I score? How did I attack their goal? How did I threaten my man? Instead of saying, how many times did they get back behind the ball? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I suppose the commitment involved in GA at the minute as well, Kevin, um, you know, it, it seems to be through the roof. A lot of people are just saying it's a full-time job with no pay. And if you're not really Dublin, you're just the kind of the, the chasing pack, which it is is true. So what have you made of the commitment over the years and even the commitment uh, brought to your life when you were playing, Kevin? It's ridiculous. John, the modern commitment is ridiculous. It's out of order. And it's, it's partly down to county boards not being able to, and indeed club committees, not being able to manage managers. Managers, Connor said it, are under pressure because they're all getting paid, right? They're demanding stuff off young fellas. 15 years ago, we'll see the demise of the dual player. And the demise of the dual player came about because egotistical managers wanted the player primarily for themselves, you know, in our club, what would happen would be that the hurlers, who were dual players, would always do the fitness with the footballers and then go do 45, 50, 60 minutes stick work. Same probably in slot knee, right? There is a way around all of this, but managers have to be willing to compromise. County boards have to take a bit of heat and pressure off managers. And I think that the commitment, you know, I remember when we first started out under PJ O'Hara in 03, in the six weeks before the National League started, in, in in the start of February, we were doing five nights a week. Five nights a week. Now that's back in 03. Two of them nights were on the Mary Peters track without a football. Now, again, you know, 
different people have different methods. You can't play football without the ball, you know? And it's it's eating into people's lives. I think that's part of the reason why a lot of these guys now I really like Jack McCaffrey's attitude. You know, he can take it he can take or leave the GAA. And I love that about him because he's saying, look, this is a whole time and commitment. I have a professional career too, you know. It's asking a lot of me. Yes, I know that I'm a tremendous player, but realistically, there's other things going on in life. Yeah. And, you know, managers have to wheel back a wee bit. I, th- I think they're far too intense, even at the higher end of, of club football now. It's mm-hmm. far too intense. And, so Yeah, and if you look if you look at it, then again, I'm, I'm a member of it and they do unbelievable work, is the GPA. You look at the GPA sort of stats in terms of on their social media stuff, how many inter-county players are getting, you know, counselling or something to help them. It's because they're going five nights a week. They're mentally breaking down. Seven, even. CG. Yeah, yeah, yeah. F- yeah. Five nights training. And yes, people talk about recovery sessions and stuff like that. But the GPA is a fantastic organisation that helps players. But their numbers are increasing in terms of, yes, they're helping people in, in terms of business planning. They're helping people in, in terms of college. They're helping people in terms... But if you look at their numbers in terms of, you know, in terms of GA players contact them saying, I'm, I'm really tired, I'm really stressed, I'm behind in work because I'm doing so much training. The numbers have went through the roof in the past couple of years. And it's exactly that reason why, because the commitment is far too big for an amateur player. It's five nights a week, as you say, uh, at a match. And recovery sessions are still recovery sessions. In, in places like Calvin, where you mightn't have a gym for about 79 mile, you know, you know, <laughs> it, it, it takes you half an hour. If you understand me, it's still a commitment to drive 10 minutes to the gym, spend half an hour in the gym, do your stretching, and then drive home. It's still an hour out of your life on a recovery day. Mm-hmm. So the, it, it goes again, as I keep saying, the proof's in the pudding that these numbers of cases are rising with the GPA in, in different aspects. It's because the commitment levels are getting so extreme. Yeah, yeah. And I suppose um, as I, we've seen in recent weeks with Brian Fent, or sorry, not even um, Michael R. McCauley and Jeremy Connolly last while stepping away, Kevin. Like, and I suppose I've always remarked on what does that hope does that give like a Wicklow footballer, each of footballer setting off of the year when they're seeing them boys retire and nearly getting sick of winning, Kevin? Yeah, well, I mean, Connolly's another great example of what we've just spoke about. I mean, Connolly sort of strikes. I don't know him personally. I've played a number of times against him. He's probably easy to, easily the best footballer I've played against. Um, he played Monday for DIT against UCD in a match, and his stats were uh, on the ball 79 times, give the ball away, never. You know, he was just a beautiful footballer, elegant. And, you know, people give criticise him about his attitude or, or this or that or his bit of his boisterousness. If Jeremy Connolly didn't have that, Jeremy Connolly wouldn't be the player that he was or is. He needed that side to him. And, you know, the dubs loved it from him. You know, Conley's the sort of guy that, you know, there was a, you know, he was sort of questioning that commitment. I could see it in the small bit. He'd done an interview maybe with Colin Keyes a while back, and he sort of said that it was becoming far, far too much, the commitment in it. You know, Michael Darn McCauley now, he's, what age is he, mid-30s? Yeah. You know, you know, you know, Mickey Linden went on to, what, 38, 39? You know, so if guys keep themselves fed, if they keep themselves about, and... If managers and trainers, you know, respect that these guys are they're amateur athletes. That's what they are. They're not professional disguised as amateurs. They're amateur athletes. Mm-hmm. So treat them that way, and you'll get more years out of them, and you'll get more time out of them, um, and you'll get you know, as I say, we'll not get as many guys walking away from the game as we do, but there has to come a time when when somebody puts the foot down. Connor put it right. The GPA, they come in for a lot of criticism when, when they first come out. They're an unbelievable organisation, what they're doing. And the help that they're giving players, the research that they're doing in terms of player hours and commitments, all of this stuff needs to be fed into the powers that be. And we need to say to coaches, look, let's get real about this. These guys are amateurs. They're not professionals. And, and, and just touching on that, like, do you think... It's like a, it's a wee it's like wee P three in in school. If I say, oh, how many do you get? Oh, I got three. And I asked another kid, how many do you get? His answer is going to be, oh, I got four. All right. It's nearly like the managers are doing that. Okay, X X county team is doing five nights a week. 
right, that's it, we're doing six. Yeah. Right, why county teams doing six, right, we're going seven. Why? Why? Why not have quality? Why not have two quality sessions a week than actually four mediocre sessions? You know, it's about the quality of the session. It's about the quality of players. It's about the quality of research or stats or whatever that you do. It's not, and again, it's the same in stats. If you get four or five good quality stats that happen during the first half, it's better than getting 100,000 stats. So managers out there, again, going back to it, if I, if I take it six nights a week, I'm getting 200 grand. If I take it four nights a week, I'm only getting 100 grand. You know what I mean? So managers are actually using it to try and get more money or make make a bigger wage out of it. But a lot of, a lot, if I was managing a team or I was coaching a team, I'd be looking and going, I need quality sessions over quantity. Yeah, yeah, without a doubt. And I suppose, kind of, to, to wrap it up, lads, uh, Kevin, yourself, I'll, I'll ask you this first. Uh, who would have been the best player you played with and against over the years? Uh, West would easily be Sean Kelly from my own club. He played with me at school, well, at, at, at the club, right up through my own age group. And he played with, um, he played with me at county and he played with me at university too. A really decent character, very cool, calm-headed, had everything in his locker, could mark a man, um, could score, you know, really good reader of the game, really ice cool on the pitch. Um, so he had all of them attributes. Um, and you know another thing, John? Once or twice, people in Antrim didn't really understand how good he was and give him a wee bit of guff, you know? Then the guys didn't see how good a guy, how good a player that they had at their hands. He is by far and away, in my opinion, the best player ever to come out of Antrim, easily. And, you know, I think it was Peter Canavan one day was was talking, uh, maybe a discussion or had about him that in that 2010 game, I think Canavan must have scored three or four points from playoff, Kelly, right? But I think it was Canavan said it was probably because the rest of the boys out the field who were meant to be playing a blanket defence were all useless, useless, and that included me, by the way. So... um, (laughs) That's how good a player he was. He could he could hold it in any team, um, and a nice, cool character. Um, so yeah, he's easy the best player he played with against. Too many to mention. Jeremy Connolly, I mentioned. Um, Shawnee Johnson, terrific, terrific player. I also played with him actually, um, in America. Um, Connor Gormley marked me once or twice for Tyrone and Kate Moore. Fabulous, fabulous footballer. Um, so, yeah, them sort of guys, you know, the best football I had, most of the best footballers ever played against actually was at college. A lot of the guys there, you got real good grinding, real education. Um, so, probably Conley, I would say. And CJ yourself? Yeah, just before that, just, just interesting that Kevin brought up about the, the players in the college. Uh, again, go back to your last point about how many Antrim players are in their college team at the minute. And the answer would be very few. So again, if they're not competing at college level in, in them sort of Sigerson teams for Georgetown Queens, how are they then going to improve and learn? Um, but um, best players to play with, I, I couldn't mention one. You know, there there is a number, and um, I, I keep saying there for different reasons. Like obviously, Kevin was an exceptional player, and Sean Kelly. I believe that if St Gauls didn't have them two, we wouldn't have won the All Ireland in terms of they were just a heartbeat. They were the energy. That good basic skills. Kelly was just a, he was a Rolls Royce of a footballer. Like he just glided through, you know, he glided through the air, like in, in his running technique. And, you know, the thing that I loved about Sean Kelly was that people, as Kevin said, people gave him a lot of guff. He probably didn't get the best of himself playing for Antrim. Um, maybe he had some great performances, but then again, people gave him a lot of guff and, and abuse and whatever. But Kelly laughed it off. And that's why he was so good. You know, boys hitting him and all off the ball. And, trying to drag him when he was trying to get on the ball and all. He just laughed it off and get on with it. And he, he was such a great footballer. Say, Kevin was different. He sort of gave us, you know, catching ability around the middle. But, you know, then Cairn, or Cairn sort of, you know, made his tip with breaking ball. You had Colin Brady there, who was an excellent defender. Terry O'Neill. Niblock, you know, Kevin Niblock was an exceptional, exceptional player. So you have five or six players around that St. Gauls panel or then five or six years that I would sort of say are the best players I've ever played with. Um, I'm not sure if you could differentiate between them because they were different types of players. Um, best players played against. Um, 
Michael Fitzsimmons probably marked him one day in a college game. Um, Johnny Cooper, um, although I probably like to say I got the better of him, but he was sort of an unknown quantity back then. He it was in a Boston a final. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, so he was a very, very good player again. And and, and and there's another one like just coming in my head. Sean Burke was an excellent footballer for us and probably was a difference maker. And in sort of the 2006 final we lost and, and then we won 2010. He was a big difference in that team because he, he ran about and he had a few boys and let the others go to work. And he did the dirty work, but he also had the basic skills as well. So... There's a lot of good players you would have played with, and there's you know Tony Scullion was another one from Cargan. It was a very good competitor and very well you know respect him very much. But he was a great athlete, and you know he was a hard, hard nut and a hard defender as well. So in the club game in Antrim, Tony Scullion was a was a, was a hard person to mark or a hard person to a hard person to try and chase. Who to say if you know I think he's still running five k's in about ten minutes. So and he's about forty. So you know there, there's lots of good players that you play with, but. I suppose like it's it's unique that every player is slightly different in in what they bring to a team. Yeah, and very very last one I'll ask you this one, Kev. First, um, if there's a young Kevin McGarty or a young person trying to break onto the Antrim team, or just to give them a bit of advice or to look after their body or like how to treat themselves. Uh, how young would they be if they were over nineteen? I tell them not to go anywhere near, just to take up golf. Um, if I'm honest, um, because they'd be wasting their time. Um, if it's a very young person, dream big, think big, never doubt your own ability. People might have thought at times that I was a very arrogant person. That might have been true because basically I wanted to be as good as anybody else. And if I didn't believe in myself, who else was going to believe in me? Um, so self-belief in this game is everything in any sport. Believe in yourself. Continuously practice the core skills. The core skills, that doesn't mean listen to some lunatic telling you go down to the gym and stick it on Instagram that you're pumping weights to this degree and that degree. When talking about the core skills is, look at somebody like Peter Kahneman on the video, it's all about winning the ball, how you catch it, how you turn a man, how you score. So practice core skills, big self-belief, and uh, that will give you the X factor. That's what it said to any kid. And CJ yourself? Yeah, pretty much the same. I suppose people said that that's the goals team was sort of maybe arrogant or whatever it's maybe just because we're winning but the one thing Kevin says there was that's and goals team believed in themselves and they would believe that we were as good as any other club team in Ulster or any other club team in Ireland and that's maybe the reason we got there yes talent got us there slightly but we believe that and that's maybe where the Antrim thing came we believe we should be getting the same as Peter Kahneman we believe we were as good as Peter Kahneman even though we weren't you still had to believe that and you still had the dream and try and push towards that standard um, so for anyone coming through at underage, if you get setbacks, you keep coming back from them, um, you, and and you have that self sort of, um, I suppose resilience. You know the resilience to come back from a, a defeat or a, a knock of being dropped in a county panel at underage. But you know um, you have to you have to work hard at it, and you have to believe in your own ability, even though you might be from one of the smaller counties or one of the smaller clubs within a county. It doesn't necessarily mean that you shouldn't be on a or that the team that you play in, whether it's Division 4, shouldn't be getting the same um, perks as a Division 1 or a Division 2 team. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, CJ McGarty, Kevin McGarty, thanks a million for joining me on the JMA podcast. Of course, this podcast is sponsored by OrgoRetro.com. Check their website for all your retro gear needs. Lads, that was funny, inspirational, and a bit of crack. So thanks a million, guys, and uh, look no after yourselves. Yeah. Yeah, so no problem. Just speaking to you later. Thanks very much.